Okay, so welcome to the third official edition of Wave Lab Workflows. Thanks for tuning in, or if you're watching this later, thanks for finding it. It will be recorded for, you know, watching later. Um, it'll be on YouTube for a long time, so, you know, you could be able to reference it and things like that. Um, in this edition, I'm going to demonstrate um, how to incorporate analog gear into WaveLab. Um, it's not quite as the same way as you would do it in something like Cubase or Nuendo. WaveLab is just a little bit different in terms of routing and configuration. And um, I think that's due to how WaveLab was originally conceived. It was basically started as a stereo two-track editor and it's evolved into what it is now, which is great. But some things are just a little bit different. So I've had people ask me, you know, how do I get audio in and out of my analog equipment in WaveLab? It's, it's a little strange, and I'm going to show you a few ways to do it. There's more than one way to do it. Um, I'm going to show you the old way first, and then I'm going to show you some stuff that was new to um, WaveLab 10, which I'm really excited about, because for me, that's really how I was used to seeing things routed and, and the whole process. So we'll go over some of that. Uh, before I forget, I did update my preferences that are linked in the YouTube description here. On, I updated it for all three videos. So um, you can go to the description and just download my whole preferences. And for those that um, need a reminder, um, of course, you download the zip file and unzip it. Then you go to WaveLab Preferences, General, and you can go to Open Setting Folder. And this will show you on your computer, whether it's Windows or Mac, where your WaveLab preferences are stored. And you can just delete all these and then place my preferences in there exactly um, how they look. So you can't, you do have to be careful to not um, rearrange the files, but you can go to Preferences, WaveLab. Pro 10, and then you'll see all that. And if you dig in, dig in a little deeper, you'll see shortcuts, presets. I basically updated some presets for mastering singles, which I'm going to talk about probably the next episode or two. Um, but just cleaned up some things and um, got some things I had been, been meaning to dial in and change. I finally took the time to change them and update them. So go to the pre uh, download those and get those in there if, if you like to keep. Um, keep track of my preferences and, and stay up to date. So um, that's basically all I wanted to say about that. So let's get into some of the ways that you can incorporate analog gear into WaveLab. Um, one way has been there for a long time, and it's called External Effects, which is basically just a plugin, a Steinberg plugin called External Effects. And there's not much to it because you have to set it up in your preferences. Now, this is not the way that I use it or um, have a lot of experience using because um, I just didn't particularly care for it. But I do want to explain it. And as you can see, there's no audio bus defined. And that's because I haven't defined one yet. So let's go into audio connections. Um, I need to remove this plugin first before I can go in there. So in our audio connections, there's four main tabs. Of course, you have to choose your interface. And some of this stuff is going to depend on your interface. I'm using an RME um, AES card, which is actually kind of nice and simple for demonstrating this because it's basically just digital ins and outs. Um, there's no um, actual conversion on the unit. It's just um, eight stereo channels of AES in and out. So it's really simple. It should translate to a lot of other people's interfaces, but of course, every interface has different configuration and settings, and some interfaces have, of course, their own mixer, like mine does. I have a lot of routing going on here, but basically I'm using this RME AES interface, which um, I find to be really stable with WaveLab. Sounds great, really stable, and you know, no issue stays out of the way. So. Um, with that being said, I've chosen my interface, and I already have a few playback buses assigned, and 
that is simply some stuff we'll get to later, but you always need a main playback bus, and I'm going to AES 1 and 2, so that's my main monitoring outputs, left and right. I'll get to these later when I show you my preferred way of going through the analog gear, but um, the next tab is for recording. So this is how you get audio back in to a, a montage for recording back in. But let's go to the external effects tab for now. And um, hopefully everything's sounding all right. Um, give me a, a comment if things need to be changed or adjusted with the sound or the visuals. But did some testing and it should be all good. Um, so I'm in the external effects tab, and as you can see, there's no ex external effects assigned yet. So let's do that now. I'm going to press the plus tab. And as I mentioned, I have, um, you know, 16 mono or eight stereo AES channels. And with mastering, we really care about, you know, the stereo channels. Typically, you know, you're working in stereo. So, um, as I said, one and two is, is my main uh, monitoring. So I have a interface, or sorry, I have a converter connected to AES 3 and 4. It happens to be the Crane Song Head Quantum, but um, that's what it is. So I'm going to choose AES 3 and 4 um, to send it out and then return back on 3 and 4. And if you want to, you can name these. So I can name it Head Q Left, Head Q Right, and could do that again here um, and I can also name it by default it's called effect one but you may want to call it something that makes more sense to you um, based on whatever it is so I've just created one external effect and now when I load um, the external effects plugin I have found that sometimes you need to um, restart WaveLab for some things to, to lock in. But now you can see I have the head as one option for going in and out of my analog equipment. Um, but let's go back into that preferences because I want to set up another one while we're at it. I could also do something interesting where I'm sending out of my head but I'm returning in through a different converter, maybe a dangerous um, A to D plus. So I could call this AD plus left, AD plus right. Oh, that would actually be the head right. So basically you can set up a lot of different paths. Um, so I could call this head out dangerous in, something like that, give it a unique name. Um, so now when I have a file loaded, let me load up a file. Um, when I have a file loaded up here, I could um, insert the external effects plugin. And choose um, whatever routing I would like. Now you're probably wondering why I have multiple converters. To me, some converters, you know, material and converters get along in a certain way. They both sound great, but I may favor on a particular song. I may want to play out of one converter and capture in with a different one. And that's how I can do it. Um, you know, just choosing different configurations in the external effects area. Um, but as I mentioned, I don't particularly care for this workflow because um, well, I can, as you can see, my analog chain is working. I'm changing the settings. Um, you can dial in a, a single song with this method. As you can see, I just have a song in the audio editor, and I have the external effects in the master section. For me, this is hard to work on albums this way, because when you're mastering an EP or an album, you usually are comparing, you know, a number of songs together. You want to make sure song one and song two sound nice together and the whole album sounds good and things like that. So this is really how you would perhaps just do one song. Um, if you just needed to work on one song and you wanted a quick and direct way of applying external effects, but again, not my preferred method. 
Um, you can also insert plugins before going analog. So if you wanted to open up an EQ and maybe do some fine tuning uh, before you go to your analog send, you could do that. You can insert an EQ. Um, you could even insert a limiter after um, the return. So after I'm coming back from analog back to digital, I could open up a trusted uh, limiter and dial that in. So now I'm doing a little EQ before going analog. I'm doing, of course, by analog processing, whatever that is, and then a little limiting afterwards. So once you've dialed that in, you know, what, what do you do with this? Um, one option is to render it. You could use some of these rendering settings. Uh, I don't have many presets for this particular area because I've mostly worked in the montage, but you could render a 24-bit wave. You could give it a name to the desktop. Um, and then you could start rendering. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop this render. But if I were to let that go, it would be um, a file on my desktop with these you know, properties. But again, that's really hard to do in album context, so that's why I'd, uh, I'm not a fan of it. But I just wanted to show you the real um, kind of old school way of doing it. You could also, um, let me put that back. You can also record a new file instead of rendering. I tend to have the transport hidden because I like the screen space, but I could press the record button and dial in some um, properties. I could call it test 01. Um, I could tell it the sample rate and bit depth that I would like. I could tell it which input path um, to be recording. I can press the record button and then I can press play on the file. And now I've just recorded a new file of audio that is through my analog chain. And so that's that was kind of the old way of having to do it. I've heard of other workarounds of having two instances of WaveLab open, one to play and one to capture. There's a few workarounds that you can do. There's more than one way to do this, but what I really want to focus on today is some of the new stuff in WaveLab 10, where you can record audio right into the montage. So I'm going to get rid of all my master section effects because, as mentioned, I really I try to avoid the master section for plugins because, and this is just a personal preference, but when you're using the master section, you have to manually save and load your settings for each song. And I, I personally know that I would forget to update something or save it or load it correctly. Um, it's not really a fault of WaveLab. It's just something that I don't like to have to think about. So I'm really happy that we can do all this stuff in the audio montage now. So let me open up. I have shortcuts for all this, but I'm going to do it the slow way so people that don't have my preferences and shortcuts, they can um, get there as well. But I'm going to go to a new audio montage, and that is my default. So I'm going to go to File, New, and I have a template, audio montage. I have a template for analog. I call it 96K analog play and capture. Um, I'm typically working at 96K unless something comes in at 88.2 or 192, then I'll work there. But I like to upsample to 96 um, when it, before I do my processing. I know that can be controversial. Some people don't agree. But however you want to do it, that's how you can do it. But I have a template um, montage here, which you can download from the des descriptions um, in this video. And what we're looking at here is a three-track montage. Track one is the track that I'm going to eventually record the audio back to. Track two is a, a, ref, a reference track. That's why it has the letter R. Um, and reference tracks are slightly, well, they're quite a bit different than regular audio tracks. And I'm going to explain what's different. And the reason there's a second reference track is because I personally like to have, so the first reference track is going to be feeding my analog chain. And there's a really good chance I'll have at least a couple plugins on each song before it goes analog. 
So what I like to do is duplicate the audio feeding my analog chain on track three, but without any plugins. And that goes to a whole separate output that I can listen to on my monitor controller. And that allows me to, um, while, the, while the audio is playing, what I can do is toggle between you know, the audio that I'm working on and dialing in, and then I can compare that with the completely untouched audio that has seen no digital plugins and no analog processing. So that helps me um, just kind of A, B stuff and compare. Technically, if you wanted to, you could just use the two tracks and you could send track two. Aside from sending it to your analog chain, you could make a duplicate. You can, with the right settings, you can send an additional signal to your monitor controller, you know, bypassing all your analog gear. Uh, but it's going to have, again, some of those, any, any plugins you use before going digital, uh, before going analog is going to have those. So it's kind of up to you if you want a completely pure AB or if you just want to kind of AB with without your analog stuff, but knowing there's a little bit of different stuff. So uh, would it be possible on a Hilo? Um, I don't think so because the Lynx Hilo has very, um, as far as I know, it has... Um, two stereo outputs and one stereo input. So I think you're going to use those up pretty quickly. And I meant to say this at the start, but I've had people ask me about analog processing in general. And you, you do need to remember that you can't do this with just a two by two interface. Um, you Really what you need is an interface that has at least two stereo outputs that are different and then one analog stereo input that's different because you need a stereo path to, of course, feed the analog gear. You need a stereo input to capture the analog gear, and then you need an additional stereo output to monitor what it is that you're doing. So something like the Lynx Hilo or the Prism Lyra, those are kind of your base basic um, interfaces for getting in and out and having something to monitor with. And of course, interfaces with more ins and outs, even better, but you, you do need more than a stereo out and a stereo input because otherwise you won't be able to hear what you're doing unless you get creative with some other types of routing that I'm not familiar with. So that being said, that's what these three tracks are. Record track, playback track, and I, I call this the raw track because it has no digital effects, no, and of course no analog processing. So let's dig into the um, audio connections again before I start doing anything and show you what's happening behind the scenes. Um, by default, you always need a main playback bus. So um, that's what this is. My main playback bus is going to AES 1 and 2, and that's what I use to listen, whether I'm working all in the box or um, you know, doing what I'm about to show you. Um, you always need a playback bus to hear what you're doing. And I've, I just thought 1 and 2 makes sense for that because it's simple one and two. I, I've manually added with this plus button, um, this head, I call it the head cue. That's one of my interfaces. Sorry, that's one of my converters connected to my interface, which is the RME. And as you can see, um, playback is AES three and four. So um, that is going to digital outputs three and four, which is a certain interface feeding my analog. It's actually feeding my mastering console and on there I can choose which um, interface is going into it to feed the rest of the chain. But my what I want to point out here is that when I made this path by pressing the plus button, I'll, here's a new one, you can have it be a reference track, um, which is a special type of track that allows you to send it to more than one output. And the other nice thing with reference tracks is that it's not included with things like um, the CD wizard. So when you go to make markers for your songs, it doesn't, it basically, it ignores anything on a reference track because you don't want markers for um, anything on the reference track. You want, you really just want your markers to be related to things that you've captured and you're arranging. So reference tracks kind of ignore a lot of things, which is nice. And there's no danger of, it accidentally being in your rendered path. So um, I think the original idea for reference tracks would, was 
when you um, get, maybe you'll get a, a version of a song that the mix engineer has sort of done their rough limiting on or a song that they like, you can put it on a reference track and then easily compare it, um, you know, some other song to what you're doing. But reference tracks are also great for, as you can see here, routing to other outputs. So I'm going to go back in here and finish this up. I'm going to delete this one because we don't need it, but you do want to have it be a reference track. And that's what I've done with all these, as you can see as I scroll through. This one is AES 3 and 4, AES 5 and 6, AES 7, 8. And then the raw output is 9 and 10. So these are all reference tracks. On the recording side, I have three stereo inputs that I can choose from in WaveLab. Um, again, just my three converters, the Head Quantum, the Neve Master Bus Converter, and a Dangerous. So these are all um, options for recording back in. Uh, and I, I've just assigned them right here, and you can name them custom if you'd like. So because I've done all that, when I go to WaveLab, it, you can see a few options here. You, my input, so track one is the record track. In the input bus, I have three choices now, right? I have the three stereo AES paths that I've ass um, assigned in there and given them names. And what's cool about this is when you're playing the audio through your analog chain, you can actually seamlessly toggle between these three or however many you have. Maybe you just have one. Maybe you have two or three. Um, it allows you in real time to hear the differences. So again, these are all great pieces of equipment, but maybe you, one of them is just a little bit nicer for this particular song. Um, some converters have character of some kind, whether it's harmonic saturation or a transformer. Uh, so maybe you're comparing um, if you like this one with some saturation or that one just clean. It allows you to hear it in real time without stopping the audio without repatching anything and um, really smooth. I, I really like this because you can just really seamlessly. And when, when you can do it that seamlessly, then you can really get into the nuance of what's different. If, is one better? Was one more favorable? Is one not as good? So these are my input bus, buses. And on track two, um, you can see track two. I don't have any audio on there yet, but track two is being sent to all three of my D to A converters. So I have, as I mentioned, three of them. I have a Head Quantum, a Benchmark, and a Dangerous. So because these are checked with the checkbox, you can uncheck them if you like, um, this track is simultaneously feeding all those digital paths. So that, again, on my mastering console, um, someone's asking about an MTC. Um, I'll have to read that in a little more detailed, but I'll answer it. Um, my mastering console is getting fed three stereo inputs from WaveLab, and then I can choose. Um, of course, I don't do that in the software. I do that right on the mastering console. I can choose and listen which one sounds better feeding the analog chain uh, for this project or this song. So it's nice to have all three converters being fed, which again feed the, the mastering console. Um, and you can turn any of them on or off that you'd like. The reason I don't have raw output chosen is something I mentioned a bit ago. I, I could send this um, to the raw output, but I, I prefer to do that on a separate track so that there's no digital plugins. So this one is only going to the raw output, and that'll make a little more sense once I load in some audio. But um, that's basically why that's like that. And so this raw path is going, you know, straight to digital path 9 and 10 on my interface and that is going directly into my monitor controller which has a digital input um, the crane song avocet and i just used the, the last aes input and now i can monitor directly without any analog gear i can just monitor what what did the original mix sound like and hopefully you're making it better than that it's a good way to compare um, what you started with with what you're doing and making sure that it's actually better so with that being said, you're probably wondering what this empty clip is. This is actually an empty clip, but it has a test tone on it. 
I just ha- I like to have a 1K tone at the start of my sessions uh, because I don't really have this problem anymore with the RME, but running a 1K tone for a few seconds can help you detect any clocking problems. Sometimes, especially subtle clocking problems, they can kind of go unnoticed in a busy, in a dense song if you're not listening closely. Um, so what, what I like to do is, as I'm working, when I start, and certainly before I print anything, I like to just play this test tone for a few reasons. One, like I said, is to, if I'm hearing any clicking, that means there's a clocking issue. A lot of times just um, power cycling a few things will clear that up, but it, certainly you want to know if there's any clocking issues. But also it's nice for a, a, a test tone just for a, a level in case you have to do any recalls. Of course, I have other apps and ways of recalling all my analog gear, but when you get all that reset, um, it's really nice to compare the recorded test tone level um, with your current you know, recalled level to make sure you're exactly where it was originally if you're doing a, a recall on, on a song. So like I said, this is just a test tone that um, I use throughout the process. And I just have it as part of my template. And you're probably wondering why you know it's like that. I basically do this in two steps. I like to have a session where I capture everything in through the analog gear. I'll listen through a reference limiter, which is doing a little bit of limiting, but uh, nothing too crazy. But more importantly, not I'm not capturing the final limiter because I want options. I want to be able to do any small tweaks needed after the first version is heard without revisiting the analog gear. Um, I like to be able to make a, a vinyl-friendly master. So I don't want to paint myself in a corner with printing my limiting on top of all the other processing. So my limiter is actually um, in the montage output. And again, this is just really being monitored. It's not getting recorded yet anywhere. It's just for, for reference. Um, so my point is I like to do this in two steps. I like to do a, a, a play and capture play and capture session where I just get everything sounding good. I'll do some cleanup work with um, a spectral editor to c- remove any clicks and pops. I like to do that after the analog capture as well because you never know if you might want to rework a cleaning up a click or a pop or some background hiss if, if you went too aggressive the first time maybe you want a second chance at it and if you do all that stuff first then you also have to redo all your analog work it's a lot of backtracking so my personal preference is when i'm mastering an album i don't do any trimming i just print everything as it is because then once it's captured through my analog chain that's when i do the cleanup work and then i bring everything into a final assembly montage where I can do the track spacing between songs, um, deal with the heads and tails of songs, the track marker placement, all the detailed stuff. I, I like to break it up into two, two things. For me, that works better because I, I can kind of make a big mess in this montage, um, get everything sounding good, then I can kind of finish it off in a clean step. So I'm going to close this and restart it. So as you can see, my cursor is just at the 15 second mark by default. That just seemed like a fine place to be because I can't have it at zero because I like to have that test tone. Anyway, and as you can see, track two is already selected. That's why it's light gray. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to import some unmastered songs. So I have a shortcut, which is just command I, which brings up this box. Let's see if I can remember the slow way. Import. Um, So this would be kind of the slow way to do it. Find your three songs. Um, I'm just going to do it the way that I know how. So I always have a folder for each artist and then a subfolder of the album title i haven't done this one yet so i'm just kind of simulating wave lab hangouts that's going to be the artist 03 analog io that's going to be our pretend album name then i have the original files which is i just picked three songs and i'm just going to load those in and this would be a good time to 
you know, you know again, I'm going to do a final assembly montage with the actual track order. Sometimes things change um, after the artist hears the first version. They might want to change the track order. But I like to at least get the songs in the proposed track order. A lot of times it stays the same. So I like to, um, like I said, get the songs in the right order. So you can use shortcuts, which is command and up and down to figure out the track order. Um, in this particular instance, I want to line up all the files on the current track. Now when I'm doing an assembly montage, I like to stagger them every other track. But for this particular part of the process, I'm going to line them up on, a cur on the same track. And this montage has different background presets in my montage assembly tracks, or if I'm in the box, it doesn't add any time between the clips. I do that manually. In this montage, I have it set to be two seconds because, again, I don't care about the song spacing right now. And I think two seconds is kind of a healthy breath between songs for any um, logistical reasons. Again, that's not the final thing. This is just um, getting things sounding good. So I'm going to insert these songs on, on the same track and are on a reference track. So as you can see, they are slightly different levels. And there's a number of ways you can address this, but one really cool thing about WaveLab, um, something that me and Pete Lyman talked about last um, episode is the, uh, the meta normalizer. And most people think of normalizing after the fact, you know, after something's master, they might normalize it to this level or that. Um, I actually really love normalization before you even get started because that allows me to um, hit my analog chain at kind of a consistent level. You know, I basically, I've been doing this for a while. Um, I've kind of determined what's a great level to send out songs at. Um, so that hits my chain. So I'm not having to completely shift gears every project based on how loud songs come in or how quiet. What I'm going to do here in a quick command is just get these songs to be roughly the same loudness. Now, of course, I use my ear to fine-tune things, but um, the, the meta normalizer is pretty great because it's, it's pretty intelligent. I just opened it up. I have a shortcut, which is shift and the letter M. But if you don't have my shortcuts, you can go to the process tab. And again, I'm in an audio montage now. And you can press meta normalizer. And there are so many... Um, so many options in here. I want to exclude any montage effect montage effects because I just care about um, the actual loudness of the file without any. And there are no real effects anyways right now. But um, I've determined that um, anywhere between minus twenty minus eighteen LUFS, and this is really going to depend on how your converters are calibrated and your preference for how loud you hit your chain. But um, for the way my things are calibrated here, um, I have it set to minus 20 LUFS. Um, but what's really cool about this is I'm using the top of the loudness range so that it's not integrated. I could do loudness of entire clip, which would be integrated, but um, that really gets kind of strange if you have a song that goes from really quiet to really loud because that's probably not going to sound the same loudness as a song that's more steady. So the top of loudness range is something unique to WaveLab, and that just kind of looks at the loudest part of each song. So basically my goal here is to get the loudest part of each song hitting the same level, which is kind of what you want when you're listening to the end result, right? Of course, this is just a starting point, but I love this feature of WaveLab is um, top of loudness range. And again, you can pick whatever loudness you think works for your... your um, analog chain. Now you do need to, and before you even open this, you need to press the ear button, the solo button. And I'll talk more about this, but basically the other thing I mentioned with reference tracks is that you can compare what you're doing to what um, something else is. So if I were using this reference track traditionally and I solo it, the nice thing about this solo button is that it's bypassing any montage output or master section effects. So you're not hearing some reference track then again through your processing chain, which is something that's hard to navigate in a multi-track DAW. Um, you know, when you load in a song to a multi-track session, 
it's going to be going through your master fader, which might have a limiter and who knows what else. Um, one of the really cool and thoughtful things about reference track is it bypasses any downstream plugins. Now you can put plugins on this stuff on the clips, but anything in the montage um, output or the master section gets is not included when you do this. But for the sake of normalization, we also need to solo this. So I have the solo button enabled, and now I can call up the meta normalizer, and within a couple seconds here. It just leveled out all the songs to be um, roughly the same, you know, loudness and at a good level for, for my chain. And what I like about this is it's non-destructive. If you go to the Clips tab, you can see that it's just changing the gain within WaveLab. It's not writing a new file or doing anything weird or, or damaging the file, mismanaging the bit depth. It's just simply turning the gain down and more specifically the pre-gain. So when it says pre and post gain, that is pre and post clip effects, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, for those that are new to WaveLab, you can, in the montage, you can insert effects on a clip, on an audio track, not to be confused with CD track, and then the montage output. So there's many places to insert effects. And basically what the, the meta normalizer just did is got all these songs to be the same level. So let me undo that because I've been talking a lot. So let's just say you load in these songs, press the solo button, open up the meta normalizer. I have a preset that I like. You could save one that works for you. Press apply. And then very quickly, those songs are all gonna be hitting my analog chain the same level. Now, of course, I fine tune it by ear. You know, if something's very bass heavy and I correct that, then I'll probably need to adjust the gain or vice versa. But that, that gets you to a really great starting point really quickly. And then you can unsolo that. So, um, at this point, we need to pr engage input monitoring, which is this green button here. And now you can see with the green button engaged, and I press play now. Again, that's a drastic change, but you can hear that it's going through my analog gear. I'm just using a filter on something to make sure it's active. Um, Without the input monitoring, we're not. it's still going through my analog gear, but we're not hearing it. So it's just the input monitor button to just hear what you're doing. It allows you to dial in your settings. So I can determine on my mastering console which pieces of gear I'm using or not using. I can adjust the EQ. Whatever I need to adjust, I can hear it happening live in real time. So that's great. And then once you're happy with the song, you can record it back into a new track. Now that might not seem very special to someone that's never used WaveLab, but this is new to WaveLab 10. Um, prior to 10, you couldn't really record back into a montage. You know, I ha I've had a few people reach out to me over the years asking if it's possible, and it's it wasn't until WaveLab 10. And for me, I just I really prefer this method. I'm more visual and and analytical. I like to just see the source file and then see it being recorded back in to a new track. You know, I don't really care for the external effects because again, you're sending it to somewhere you can't see and then you have to load it back in. Um, and also um, from a, another standpoint, when I record all these songs back in, you know, there's going to be a little bit of noise floor. My mastering chain is very quiet, but there's a little bit of a noise floor. So I personally would have a hard time sending out masters that weren't properly, you know, trimmed and faded at the very, very end, the tails, you know, fading out any noise floor from the, you know, that came in with the file, of course, but then any noise floor that your chain is adding, which hopefully is not much, but it is something. And I would just have a hard time blindly rendering out files and calling that the master, you know, so I need to load, I need to record them back in. Of course, adjust the spacing between songs and then, you know, trim the heads and tails, things like that. So that's why I really like this method. I know a lot of new users of WaveLab as of 10 have enjoyed this, this method as well. So before I do any recording, as I mentioned, I can um, choose different input paths. And um, I know you're not hearing the audio right now, um, but I am hearing... You know the converters the, the sound of each 
A to D converter and I can choose which one do I think is most appropriate for the song. And there's no hiccup. Uh, maybe I can play it. Now it's pretty smooth. There's a little tiny tick that lets you know it's working, but you know, again, it's going to be subtle, but when you can do these real time comparisons, you might say, Oh, I like this converter for this particular song. And it's really a nice feature of wave lab. I always just keep it firing to all three or however many D to A's you have, because it doesn't really matter. You just choose it on your mastering console. Um, and then before I start adding plugins, you know, I was just making sure things are working. Um, there's a cool feature here where you can right click in the reference track and you can duplicate or you can copy the clips to another track. So I'm going to copy these clips to reference track three. And it's going to ask if I want to do all or just the selected ones. And I'm going to do all of them. So now I have a copy of all that normalized and this is how I can AB on my monitor controller. And this is definitely not going to come through on the stream because of routing logistics. But as you can see, um, track three, which is another reference track, going only to the raw output. So now when I'm playing music, I'm going to purposely not. So now when I'm playing, I could be listening to um, what I'm doing with my all my settings. And then I can very easily toggle the other input on my monitor controller to hear track three, which is, of course, no digital processing, no analog processing. And um, some people may want to hear it level matched. Some people don't. I, I have a really basic limiter on here that's just boosting it up um, a few dB, I guess, because I, I tend to have a pretty fixed workflow. As you can see, I, I tend to run everything through the chain at a pretty consistent level. Of course, um, changing the tone and character from project to project, song to song. But I tend to capture in at a pretty similar level for most styles of music. So that allows me to insert a limiter on the reference track to kind of boost it up to about where I capture in. It's not scientifically perfect, but I can really easily AB what I'm doing with what the source was with a little added gain to match it. And then I can decide if what I'm doing is better. You know, if you don't want it level matched, you could remove that limiter. Um, there's other plugins like Ian Shepard's uh, Perception plugin. You could probably get creative. Um, this is just my quick method of boosting up the unmastered version to get it close to how, where I'm printing it in, which again is not my final level. I, I tend to capture at a certain level and then use a digital limiter to get that last push you know, wherever it needs to be. You know, sometimes you send it out, the client loves it. Sometimes they say, it sounds great, but can you make it a little louder? And with this method, you don't have to revisit your analog workflow to um, to make it a little louder. You just have to open the, the, the final montage assembly, um, add a little more limiting, render new files, you're good to go. There's no, not a lot of recall involved with, with something like that. So that's what this is. I normally have track three hidden as well. I just wanted you to be able to see it, but I don't really need to look at it. This gives you more screen real estate, but I just wanted you to see what's going on there. So we can just kind of ignore track three. It's just gonna be playing to its own stereo digital output that I can select on my monitor controller. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend I only use analog gear. I use quite a lot of plugins as well. So, one nice thing about WaveLab is you can have clip effects. A clip effect is um, a plugin that goes directly on each audio clip, which in this case is each song. Um, and you can split songs up into multiple clips if you need to uh, for some reason, but I tend not to in this stage. I tend to keep all the songs intact. So I could insert an EQ on this clip and this is going to be before going analog. So now when I play this song, you can see it's going through this EQ. When I play this song, it doesn't have a clip effect yet because I haven't inserted one. So this plugin is only affecting this song, and it's only affecting it um, before it goes analog. So that's kind of nice because I think a lot of people that are mastered with analog gear, I think we're doing a lot of the surgical 
any big stuff we're doing with digital stuff. And then the analog is more about broader strokes and just kind of general um, tone shaping tone shaping and sweetening. You know, we're not, I, I'm finding myself doing less and less with the analog gear. It's more about just adding a little bit of color. And with this method, you know, you can, if you have a record that's really well mixed and fairly consistent, you can get away with a lot of the same analog settings if you, of course, norm, do the normalization that I did where it's hitting the chain at the same level, which, of course, you can fine-tune with the clip um, level envelope, or you can even, if you weren't happy with how this one was adjusted, you could just click in here and adjust the gain yourself um, a number of ways. Obviously, that would be too quiet, but... So you can man manually type in numbers here. You can do the envelope. You can draw level automation. You know, if I thought this intro needed to be boosted more in, into the analog chain, I can do that. Or maybe this bridge needs to be boosted into the analog chain. Um, things like that. Or maybe you think this part just gets too loud. So this is pretty powerful stuff. This is all before the analog chain. And... Um, I should do this a while ago, but of course you want to save your montage. Um, this is part of why I like my folder structure, because when I go to save the montage, this is what pops up. It's already pointing to the path where the files came from, right? It came from, I called this the artist name, this is the album title. So it already kind of knows a, a, a logical place where it should save the montage file. And again, the montage file is what saves everything that we're seeing, all, all the the layout, all the plugin settings we're going to do. But I like to just be able to copy. I'm going to pretend that's our band name or artist name. I love being able to just copy this stuff. I'm a big copy and paster, and I have another shortcut for that. Um, actually, we're doing this.
Are we back? Hello, hello. Well, I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit. I apologize for the hiccup. I really don't know what happened, but it seems like we're back. Um, I'll try to back up a little bit. Um, can't, I don't know for sure. If someone wants to t- tell me where it left off, I can t- try to look. But I think basically what I was getting at is you can put clip effects on each song. And um, before going analog... And I think that's pretty common. I think a lot of people, you know, doing a lot of mastering work, I'm really comfortable relying on the digital stuff for a lot of the shaping and then, again, analog for just broader strokes. Um, and what that does, that kind of allows me to compare song, um, song to song because sometimes I'll think I've got the first song dialed in nicely. And then after I get to song two or three, then I realize... I jump back to song number one and maybe it's a little too dark or a little too bright or needs a little more low end. So I I like to be able to dial in all the songs as far as I can before I commit. And in some cases, you know, I've been able to use the same or very similar analog settings because they're just broader strokes. You know, I'm not doing anything. I'm not boosting 3 dB of a certain frequency in the analog realm. Unless I may be doing a single, I can dig in. I like to just keep the analog gear a little more subtle. Um, oh, I was at how to save the montage. Um, okay. Well, let me, um, let me back up there. I'll make a new montage. So this is my template. I've talked about all that. I'm going to load in the three songs. I'm going to delete something. So we're starting like I normally would. So load in these three songs, get them in the right order, whatever it may be. Press the solo button, normalize. Um, Copy to the reference track. Again, I can hide that. We don't need to see it anymore. Oops. Well, now I really did it. something like that Um, so what you probably want to do pretty early on is save the montage and so I think this is where it must have cut off as soon as I press command s to save it um, this window pops up and it already knows a pretty logical place to uh, save the montage file which is kind of like your project file where everything is saved so I like to just copy the artist name, then I can copy the album name. Apologies for the stream problems, but I'm monitoring it more closely. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, so now we're ready to add some, you know, we can hear we can hear the song. We can add some effects. As I mentioned, I have kind of a good default clip effects chain that gets me a good starting point. Again, no EQ actually dialed in, but just ready to go. And now I'm listening to what it sounds like. And let's say I'm really happy with this first song. What I can do here is, uh, there's shortcuts for all this, but I'll try to do it the slow way. I can copy in the inspector. I can copy all the effects. I can select the two other songs and I can paste that effects chain to the selected clips. Now, of course, 
that doesn't mean those songs are going to sound good, but it could be a good starting point if these are similar enough songs. So now I can start working on this song. Um, if, if it's very different, you know, you, at some point you need to record this back in. There's a few ways you can do it. You can go song by song, which is obviously the old school, um, an old school way of doing it. Um, if you're really re doing different analog settings for every song, but if you're using the analog gear in more of a broader sense, you can kind of at least do some comparisons before you commit. And then maybe when you do commit song two, you'll note that maybe you want to change a, an EQ or compression setting a little bit for this particular song. But this helps you just kind of get everything roughed in and say, I like what I got going on here. Um, and then you can commit. So basically we need to record back in. And now, like I mentioned, I usually have the transport hidden because then you get a little more space. Um, so to record back in, my shortcut is just control and the letter R. You do have to arm the track and you got to keep the input monitor. So this is the record arm button. Um, before you do any recording, um, you can, and for some reason this window keeps popping up on my other screen, but this, um, you can do automatic file properties or you can do custom file properties. So you may want to call this, you could call this song one, pass one. <clears throat> of course, you could put the real title. Um, you could call it capture one. You can, you can call it whatever you want. This is basically going to be the named file. So um, pretty much all of our converters are 24-bit still. I say still because there are a few 32-bit converters coming on the market but I haven't seen any for the pro audio. It's mostly for location audio. So you don't get clipping and distortion if something unexpected happens. So I don't really see the advantage to recording higher than 24 bit. Of course, the WaveLab audio engine is processing at 32 bit float or 64 bit floating point, whatever you have it set to in the preferences. But for the recorded audio, 24 bit I think makes sense because I'm recording back in through my a to D converter, which is obviously a maximum of 24 bit. It's not a 32 bit converter or 64 bit. So these are some of the settings you can dial in before you actually do the recording. And one other little nice thing here is um, you can drop a marker. It can be any kind of marker. Um, even a, I like to just use a generic marker for this purpose. Um, what happens here is one of the options is you can s tell it to stop recording when it reaches the last marker. So let's say you're happy with this first song. You need to print it back in, right? Well, you can press, as long as it's record enabled, press um, Control R is my shortcut for it. You can also use the transport or assign your own shortcut. So now I'm recording back in. Um, any, of course, any clip effects, recording the analog processing, and then it's capturing to a new track using um, this particular input. Um, now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead. But the whole point of this um, marker I'm showing you is it's going to stop recording when it hits that marker. And that's kind of nice because you can hit record, and then you can go um, take a stretch, you know, use the restroom, grab a bite to eat real quick while it's recording you don't have to worry about recording for 10 or 15 minutes if you get distracted it's going to stop recording when it hits the the last marker in the session um, if you have that option chosen so um, that's kind of the basics of getting audio in and out of your um, analog chain with wave lab um, there's a whole lot more we can touch on and we're going to touch on but um, as you can see audio is passing and that's all because of how we have it set up in audio connections. Again, not using external effects. I think that's, I don't want to say it's bad, but it's its kind of an old way of working in WaveLab. I think a lot of people are preferring the new method of just recording back to a new track. Um, just because that's how you're used to doing it in other DAWs. You know, you have a, a source track and a capture track. And to me, this is nice and simple. So let's say that I... Um, I'm going to, let's just pretend 
that I recorded these back in and that these are the recorded um, let me put them in the correct order so it makes a little more sense timeless so let's say that you know these are the recorded versions back from analog um, obviously they'd be a little bit louder but um, so the nice thing that I was talking about is as you can see this limiter I'm listening to um, what I'm doing through a, a limiter and you can determine which limiter and by how much but I'm just doing a moderate amount of limiting you know if this was being actually recorded in at the level I normally would this would be doing a moderate amount of limiting and that way there's no surprises you know I, I got a rough idea of what things sound like when they're limited but I'm not committing to that limiting because again that really just paints you in a corner um, especially if you're a busy mastering person um, you know you don't want to have to redo your whole analog chain, everything, um, just to make it a little bit loud or a little less loud. I've, I've been getting a few requests for making it less loud, which is kind of nice lately. So if you painted yourself in with that limiter, then um, that's not great because then there's a lot of backtracking to make any tweaks. So I think a lot of people are capturing in at kind of a more sane level, something that's going to work for vinyl or a more dynamic master if your client ends up being someone that doesn't care about it being the loudest thing ever then you're uh, you have a lot of flexibility and you can even add effects to these clips now you could say um, maybe the client loves it but they just want to touch more bass on song one you could go to the clip effects and just add a little more low end um, that's gonna be after your analog capture but before your final limiter um, and you can also You'd also do a, a bit of cleanup work, of course. You know, these files were nicely trimmed, but of course, I'd probably want to um, fade this down. Um, you can turn ripple mode off if you don't want it to move. Um, this is, again, not my final assembly montage, but just getting things basically cleaned up. Um, another great new thing with WaveLab 10 and something that you can, that I would do in this stage is. Then I listen to my captures, uh, usually with headphones, and for any clicks and pops. And if I hear a click or a pop, I can highlight it and go to um, – well, I have a sh the thing is I have a shortcut for it. So um, that's why I don't recall where it is. Um, Basically, you can open this in an external editor, such as Spectre Layers. I, I haven't been able to get up to speed with Spectre Layers yet. It looks very cool. Um, but any external audio editor, you know, if this was a click or a pop, you could highlight it, remove it, save it, close it, and now you got the fixed version in there. Um, and I'm just having a a brain freeze about where where that is. Um, oh, it's got to be an edit. So if you highlight a section and go to Edit external editor boom there it is you can do your fix whatever it may be obviously you wouldn't normally do that but and you can have more than one external editor assigned you go to global preferences um, you can have spectral layers whatever you want so that's this is a cool time to do that and of course now your song is chopped up into a few bits and pieces so you have to uh highlight it and make a new file and then you can do that kind of in your final then you can do your final montage assembly which i showed a little bit in my very first video and we're going to dig deeper in future episodes about you know final assembly but this is um again i like to do it in two steps and another nice thing about reference tracks let's say these were edited or offset or maybe move them closer when you do the cd wizard which again this is not really what a normal montage looks like for me but when you run the cd wizard um, you can see that markers are only made for clips that are on real tracks it ignores reference tracks so um, man there's so much more we can get to i could probably do a second one of these um, digging a little deeper but we've already gone an hour um, i wanted to tr see if there's any questions and maybe we can address them another time but i really just wanted to get a video out there for people who are new to WaveLab or haven't explored the analog routing options just to see how it's done in WaveLab because it's 
There's no buses in Wave Lab. There's no bus one and two, bus three and four. You just have to make these playback and recording paths yourself based on your interface. You can use external effects. Um, you know, if you and the nice thing with Wave Lab 10 is external effects can be um, within a montage. So let's say I um, this is kind of another way that you could do it. You could uh, make a montage and you could arrange the songs in a more traditional way. Um, you can go to clip effects, external effects, and you can put um, an external effects loop right on each clip now in the, in the montage, which is pretty cool for, you know, some people might like this, but again, um, now you have to render that out to a new file and then it's somewhere else that you can't see and then you have to load it in. So I just really like the other way where you get a more visual of seeing what you started with and what you've recorded and editing it that way. Um, but just for those that like to use the external effects, you can um, put it right on clips now. You can, of course, put it in the montage output. I've even seen people, I don't know if I recommend this because it's a lot of trips in and out, but I've seen people with eight or 16 channel interfaces that will use it almost like a patch bay where they have a certain piece of gear on outputs three and four and inputs three and four, and then another piece of gear on five and six. And you can kind of keep stacking external effects. Um, so this could be a certain upward EQ. This could be a certain upward compressor and you can change the order. But again, that's a lot of trips in and out of your um, A to D, A to D. So I guess you have to be the judge if that's degrading the sound or not, but it is possible to just connect all your gear right to your interface if you have a lot of ins and outs. Um, so external effects have been heavily upgraded and uh, enhanced in WaveLab 10 so that now we can do a little bit more of a traditional play and capture um, operation here right inside the montage. And again, the, the beautiful thing with the montage is all the settings are saved and stored in the montage. Um, so if I need to revisit something, I can. Nothing is really in the master section. I, as you can see, I just keep it hidden and out of sight because um, this requires manual loading and saving, and I don't trust myself to do that correctly. It's a lot to manage. So everything that I am sh showed you in this last step is saved right in the montage. So I'm going to try to excuse the mic bump here. I'm going to try to take some questions. Um, latency. Um, yeah, latency is going to depend a bit on your interface as well. Um, there is, I said it once and forgot it, but there is in the options section, there is, um, I should know where this is, but I just don't, I haven't had to change it since I said it. Somewhere there is a way to, oh yeah, record latency adjustments. You can, um, calculate the latency of your converters and interface based on everything you have going on and you can offset the um, recording so that it's perfectly in sync with um, the original source um, if, if that's important to you for me it is because it helps with um, recalls and occasionally even punch-ins if if uh if you've done a lot of work and they've only changed the intro, sometimes you can get away with um, some splices and punch -ins. So you can change the um, latency there. Um, do I ever clip the AD stage? Um, years ago, I used to clip it harder. I've kind of shied away from that. It, it can sound, um, I don't want to say better. It can be different or more usable than certain digital limiters. Digital limiters have gotten pretty good though. And I also don't really care to paint myself in that corner. Um, especially if I know a project's going to vinyl, you know, I don't want to be stuck with something that's clipped. Um, if it's, if it's a single song that I know may never go to vinyl, uh, maybe I'll hit the A to D a little bit harder. Um, uh, cause I know that it's not a concern and that they'll probably want it super loud anyways. But yeah, I mean, that's there's a million threads on the internet about clipping the A to D converter. I, I would say I don't do it as much as I used to, but a good mastering grade converter will, will be able to handle it. Um, do I use in the box limiting and clipping? Um, yeah, I mean, there's 
for me, it's usually a little, you know, subtle, you know, do it in stages, a, a little bit of clipping before the limiter can help get it louder without so much artifact. You know, you just got to be really subtle and careful with, with your choices instead of doing it in one big step. Um, do you record your plugins on the clip track when you record the analog chain? Um, yeah, so basically the, the, the signal flow is I load in. Let me open this back up. I load in the files like I showed you. And let's say I didn't record anything yet. So the basic signal flow is I'll have, I usually have at least some form of e something on the clip effects, whether it's a subtle EQ or more aggressive or some de-essing, um, de-harshing, things like that, um, or even a, a little bit of multiband. Um, I don't like to use multiband a lot, and just because it's a multiband doesn't mean you have to use all the bands. It's usually just one or two targeted areas. But um, so yeah, there's plugins on the, the song before it even goes analog. So of course, that means these are getting recorded because it's going the the path would be the the unmastered clip you know no plugins then there's plugins on the clip that's going out to my analog chain and getting recorded back in so it's recording any pre-analog plugins it's recording the analog chain settings and then recording it back to a new track but, but what it's not recording is my limiter the limiter is just there doing like i said kind of a moderate setting so I can get a feel for how it sounds limited. Obviously, I can tweak it per project, but that's what the only thing I'm not committing to is the actual limiting because I don't want to paint myself in that corner yet. I want to be able to go any direction, um, whether it's for revision purposes or for vinyl purposes or um, what what have you. It's nice to um, now. Of course, the limiter does eventually get rendered when I do the final assembled montage and um, get everything just right. So that's why I like to do it in two stages. I kind of like to make a mess in this montage and get everything sounding good and then button everything up in kind of a normal... Let's see if I have a normal montage. Um, I don't, but you've seen it in other videos where um, there's really very little going on processing-wise. It's more about arranging the songs, doing the track markers, metadata, titles, all the detailed stuff... Um, so I think that answers that. There was a few other questions. Um, I find myself capturing in anywhere between, if it's modern pop and rock, I'll capture in maybe minus 14, minus 12 LUFS. Um, and those are rough numbers because no one ever talks about if they're referring to integrated LUFS or short term or maximum short term or, you know, momentary. But um, I like to kind of capture in it like usually, you know, unless it's a crazy song integrated around minus 14, minus 12. Because um, really, unless you're doing classical or traditional jazz, you know, no one's going to want it any quieter than that. And that's still relatively vinyl friendly, even though you can't make a direct correlation of LUFS and vinyl. I mean, vinyl basically doesn't like square waves. It doesn't like peak limiting. It doesn't like clipping. And that's w once you start going beyond minus 14, minus 12, usually in most balanced mixes, that's when you start to introduce some limiting that or clipping that isn't going to be friendly for those other formats. So that's typically where I'm printing in, but there's certainly no rules. Um, it just kind of depends on the project. I've printed things in at minus 10, minus 9 LUFS, knowing that it's not going to work for vinyl. If they decide to do vinyl, we'll have to have that discussion. But sometimes clipping or driving it in harder does sound good for a particular track. Do you always work on an external hard drive in WaveLab? Um, yes. I, I always, I'm a little bit old school. I always have a external audio drive. Um, for me, it makes it easy to back things up and keep things, keep track of things. Um, once projects are done, they get moved to an archive system that has multiple backups of that. But I always have a, right now I have a one terabyte solid state drive that just has all my active projects. I never have problems with crackles and pops with the external drive. I can't remember the last time I did. I mean, many years ago, in the, you know, in the mid 2000s, 
um, it was basically an unwritten rule that you had to use an external drive for your audio because the computer just couldn't handle that. And I've just kind of stuck with that method. Now I do have a home rig where I do work from the internal drive because I just sync things via Dropbox. Um, and that's fine too, but I'm not doing every project that way. It's just for certain things. Um, but every, my main rig, it's, um, an external drive. It just helps keep things organized. So I know where all my audio projects are. I can have them backed up this way or that way with carbon copy cloner, backblaze, what, what have you. Um, so I just like to keep everything separate, but I haven't had any issues with crackles and pops, but I tend to, I've had solid state for my working drives. Um, for a long time now, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, what interface do I need to be able to do this with the Hilo? Can't well, the Lynx Hilo is popular for um, people just getting out of the box for mastering. There's nothing wrong with it. I, I had one for a long time, but I used it in standalone mode, um, so it wasn't my main interface. But you know, the limitation with something like the Hilo or the Lyra is you have only two stereo paths to get out so you can play the stereo audio into your analog chain you can l capture it back in through the a to d and then you can listen to that but that's really all that's really all you can do it's kind of it's just there's not it's just a very limited layout you know you, um, there's other digital ins and outs and there's usb but for the most part it's it works as a monitor controller and but it's pretty limited so i'm not really sure how to answer that question i, I really prefer this um rme just super stable pretty popular in the mastering world you get eight stereo ins and outs are all digital and then you can con connect the converters of your choice for running through your chain and monitoring and metering i have a few metering loops which is why i like to have so many channels you know i I have hardware meters, software meters that, you know, WaveLab has great built-in metering, but I also like to um, be able to meter my analog chain before going back to digital or if I'm listening to vinyl. So anyways, I have a lot of nice metering loops with that interface as well. Um, how can I work with WaveLab and my MTC1X? I have only one audio interface, which is the Prism. Um, I don't know how to answer that one really. You might have to message me in the in the Facebook group and um, we can sort that out. But you know, if you only have the Prism ADR8, I'm guessing that has eight ins and outs. Um, I mean, you could set up one stereo path for your monitoring. You could set up another stereo path to feed your analog chain. You could set up an additional stereo path to send the unmastered and unprocessed audio to another input on your MTC. Um, so you can kind of listen to original and then what you're doing. <laughs> um, those are kind of the options there. Um, the reason I have so many options is because each converter has sort of its own signature sound, but you know, something like a Prism ADR8, those are basically all the same channels, same sounds, so you're not really getting an advantage of um, different character there, but it could help with routing to send things different places. Um, see if there's any other questions. I'll go back down to the bottom. Cannot save my montage to an external drive. Is there a setting? That might be another one to talk to me in the group about um i've never seen it talk about um usually it's a uh, permissions thing but i guess one thing i did want to mention and i forgot to um there's there's when you do record in the montage it's going to create a data folder for you and these are all the little recordings i did uh, they're not very well named but um you, you could obviously develop a better naming naming scheme than I did because I was um, focusing on the video. But this is where all, all your recorded audio ends up. And then the nice thing about that is when you back up or archive your project, you can be confident that everything you need is in this master folder. And then you can put that on your archive system or 
wherever it needs to be. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's where it saves. If if you're not careful, it can save in a very random place. And you don't want to do that because um, I could uncheck that box. I could save it to this really random folder, but that's bad because if I go to back up this project, the actual recorded audio is going to be wherever this is, and that's going to be a problem when you go revisit the project. So you always want to check the right audio file in the montage data folder. That way um, it's going to be easy to find if you move between computers. It'll go, it'll travel with the folder and of course be backed up. So that's one thing that I should have mentioned. Um, yeah, the interface I'm using, it's RME AES. Um, I'll try to, it has two apps. Um, that's one of the apps that just handles the technical stuff. And then this app, not that one, this app handles kind of the routing so I can determine um, all sorts of things. I have it locked right now. I like that you can lock it so you can't accidentally change stuff. But this just lets me very easily um, do my basic ins and outs and then some meter loops and stuff like that. So this is a highly recommended interface if you want something really stable with WaveLab and really flexible. Of course, it's not a converter, though. It's just a digital interface, and then you have to connect your converters. But works great for me and a lot of others. So um, Lynx makes the Lynx AES 16E, which I used to have. Um, it gave me a little more trouble, which is part of why I have my um, test tone for checking for clocking problems. But the RME is very, very stable. Um, is there a difference in the sound quality if you render your clip plugins versus capturing them through a high-end A to D converter? Well, I mean, you have to make a choice. You know, I don't use analog gear on every project. You know, there's some projects where I stay 100% digital, so I can usually listen to a project when it comes in and just decide which path I'm going to take. You know, if it's if it already sounds really great and it's already fairly loud, ten, I tend to stay digital. If it's really delicate, if it's instrumental piano music, um, acapella music, uh, really sparse acoustic folk music, I tend to stay digital as well because I just don't feel like it needs any analog color or noise. Um, if it's other types of music just sound better going analog. So I just make an informed decision based on experience. I mean, going out to analog and back to digital, it's going to have some impact on the sound and that's really just gonna depend on the quality of your interface and the converters and your whole signal path. I mean, ideally, if you want your analog path to be transparent, it can be, but there's just a lot of variables there. So I, there's some projects I stay all digital and use clip effects and you know montage output effects and then some projects where I incorporate the analog gear. It's just a personal choice there about which way to do it. Um, heal a track that has um, some separations. Yeah, there's a few ways to heal um, something. Let me load in a file. Let's say that I captured this in, but then I did a lot of fixes. You know, let's say we had to do some edits to cl clean some clicks and pops, things like that. Um, if you hold Shift and Command, I'm on Mac, obviously. If you hold Shift and Command, it really easily lets you select all those. And there's, there's at least two ways to do this. One way would be... Um, I can't remember if this is a new feature, but you can bounce selected clips. And this is all pre, um, I have a limiter here, but it's not gonna um, go through that limiter, which is what I want because I, I don't wanna, I just wanna heal this. I don't want it to go through my uh, montage effects or anything. So I can press that button and now it's healed. These are all locked in now. You could also render it um, and what, 
I'm hoping to find a smoother way to do this, but you could select the entire song. And I did make a shortcut for this, but there's an f- option called create generic region from selection. So you could select the entire song again, create a generic region. Then you could go to the render tab and um, the audio is going to be floating point at this point. So you'd want to choose floating point and you'd want to render um specific region i didn't name this region but you could also do a a render of this but then it's going to go somewhere else as i mentioned and then you have to load it back in so probably the easiest way is the bounce option Um, and then there's also super clips which i have not a ton of experience with because my personal workflow didn't require it but um Ian Stewart has made a really cool YouTube video about super clips that you can um, watch. You can find it on YouTube, but um, this option here, create a super clip. The clips will be replaced by a super clip um, pointing to a sub montage. So this gets a little bit um, off. Um, you got to be a little more careful with what's going on here, but um, that's another way to do it is super clips. And depending on some of these settings, it will ha- it'll be including the clip effects or track effects. So you just have to be careful about what you want included. If you simply just want the clips to be um, made into one single clip again, I think bounce is the um, perhaps cleanest way, but there's more than one way to do it. So hopefully that helps answer that question. And again, check out Ian Stewart's uh, super clips video on here. Um, So I think we're getting close to the end of all the questions here. If anyone has any more specific questions, um, feel free to uh, go to the WaveLab users group on Facebook. And that's the best way to ask. Sometimes people direct message me and I prefer if you ask on the Facebook page because then everyone can see the answer and it might help them as well. Um, someone's asking about the Stream Deck, and then I'll wrap it up. Stream Deck is really handy in WaveLab. Here's my WaveLab profile, which may or may not make sense to everybody. But um, I'll try to post this, a link to this as well. But I just use it for, um, like, if I'm going to make a custom montage duplicate, which I do for every project, um, first thing I'm going to do is copy the name of the current montage and then I'm going to call up the montage duplicate window so let me uh, this is the 96k version so instead of having to copy the name and then call up the montage duplicate um, window I can do that in one command I can press the stream deck copies the name opens up the montage duplicate so what it's really good for is like stacking um, shortcuts if you, if you always do this, then you always do that. Um, it's great for that to kind of combine shortcuts. You know, I have a, a key command, or I have a Stream Deck button for my default album montage, my default single montage, which is something I just added um, last week. So if you download the new settings, you'll see this. And I'll explain why I have that. Um, or a new analog capture montage which is what i've been showing you i can press one button and that montage is open i can press this button and um not only is that's i forgot about that not only does it make the new montage but it also presses the import button because what's the first thing you do when you make a montage right you want to import some files so the stream deck lets me create the new montage from a template and then it's already asking me what files i want so that's kind of cool um what else do I do with the Stream Deck? Of course, um, you can use it to call up um, certain meters. The bit depth meter is nice. Sometimes you want to see what the bit depth is of something. This is floating point because it's not being dithered. Phase scope I like to call up. Sometimes I want to see the time code of the clip start or the track start, which this one doesn't have any tracks. Um, Let me try to go to a, 
album with tracks. Uh, been doing a lot of singles lately. So here's kind of a rendered version with some... Uh, let me open this one. So the stream deck will let me see the track start or the usually clip start and track start are kind of similar because everything's pretty clean here. But let's say the song was split up into two clips. The clip time code is going to change back to zero in a second here. It's a new clip, but I can also see the track time code is still you know, 124, 125, things like that. Um, Analyze file is another one that I just came up with. Um, this is kind of only going to make sense if you know my workflow, but um, I kept doing this repeated step where, um, so this is my print, this is my render 96K. This is a pretty quiet dynamic album, so it might not be a good, let me do something that's crazy loud. So here's, a, that's not that loud either. Um, so here's a single I mastered and the instrumental version following it. Um, when the resulting montage is made, um, one of the clips is selected and one isn't. Sometimes you want to analyze that file. And I kept having to open it in the editor, unselect that so it's going to analyze the whole file, open the analyze box, press analyze, just to see if there's any um, peaks that went over zero after the sample rate conversion. Um, so what I found is that I could do Stream Deck, I can just press one button, it's going to open it in the editor, unselect, run that. So basically one, in the press of one button I can analyze a rendered file to, to uh, see if there's any peaks over zero. So instead of all those steps I just press analyze file, opens it unselects it. Um, the other thing I use it for is CD text. Um, so let's say I'm making a new montage from some stuff I captured. And that's the song order. Um, I have a button that calls up the CD wizard. And of course, um, I didn't just use it. This is my preferred CD Wizard starting point, which is part of the mo uh, montage preset. I can just press the CD Wizard on the Stream Deck, and it um, applies it. I haven't saved this yet. I'm just going to save this on the desktop so I can trash it later. But let me run that again. The, uh, the CD Wizard button creates markers with my preferred setting and then it saves it again. The, the montage is saved again. So it's basically stacking shortcuts. Um, CD text, I have one called CD text start and I can press that button. And what that does is it copies, um, this would be better if I named it something proper. So, so I'll just say artist. This is why I use such strict naming schemes when I'm really working. But so now, you know, I made the markers. They're based on the file names. Everything's clean. Um, the CD text start button will copy. The first thing it does is it copies the name of the montage because I'm going to reuse that information, right? So it's copying the name of the montage. Then it's calling up the CD text editor box. And then from there, I can just... Um, uh, this is why I use um, a lot of shortcuts so there's no spelling errors. I'm not quite working in my element here, but you get the idea. So now I can really quickly add the CD text um, to a project. So let me just start over on that. Let me get this name correctly so it doesn't drive me nuts. This is why I always copy and paste from everything because then there's no, no errors. So let's say I've arranged these how I want them. That's great. 
CD Wizard Stream Deck, CD Tech Start Stream Deck. I'm naming it the album title. The artist name is there. I can pop it over. Now I got all my CD text entered, which of course transposes to metadata. So that's a quick overview of how I use the Stream Deck. Um, maybe I'll post in the WaveLab users group, I'll post a link to my profile. Because one cool thing about the Stream Deck is you can... Um, You can back up these profiles and, or export them. and Because I have one for my home setup too, and I, I can keep the settings in sync very easily because you can easily export. Um, is it okay to remaster a song with 24, 192, or 32? Well, some people argue that going higher than 96K is um, sort of pointless. I'm not going to say whether or not that is or not. That's an opinion. Um, there are there are some people that will upsample to higher sample rates before they start processing, and they believe that. Of course, the upsampling doesn't add any sound quality, but it could be said that um, the processing sounds better at a higher sample rate, whether using all digital or all analog. That's kind of for you to decide, but I can tell you that there are people that do upsample before they start, even if it was originally 48K or 44.1. Um, I tend to not upsample any higher than 96. I just don't think it's worth the headaches it introduces. Um, but if I do get something in at 192, which I've gotten a couple of the last few weeks, I will keep it at 192 for all the processing and then downsample once all my processing is locked in, which I'm, I sort of showed in earlier videos and I'm going to do a more detailed, um, overview probably in the next coming months so i'll show you that but i think we're going to leave it there thanks for tuning in and watching this whole time i apologize for the that's the first time the stream has ever stopped so i don't know what's up with that but i'll look into it thanks for watching this check out wave lab users um, on facebook for any um, questions there's also the wave lab forum uh, public forum where it's a good place for support from the wave lab developer um, and the WaveLab 10.0.6 update should be out relatively soon. Um, in fact, yeah, it'll be out relatively soon. I can't say exactly when, but it's, I would say it's somewhat imminent. So, um, watch for the latest update for WaveLab soon and, um, have a great afternoon. Thank you for watching and we'll be, I'll be back next month with another,